today's episode of Vice Versa, we're talking about autonomous driving, autonomous driving company consolidation, EVs taking over gas cars by 2027, the first commercial scale offshore wind farm in the US, Tesla suspending Bitcoin payments, and more. And as usual, I'm joined by Ricky Roy, the man who convinced me to buy way too much Dogecoin. How you doing, buddy? <laughs> well, depending on what date that trigger you pulled, that might have been a good idea or not. But who can keep track with Elon and his tweeting about these oh, cryptocurrencies, man. man? It's been a wild week. Um, I'm doing well. It has been, I've had three trips back to back to back after 16 months of <laughs> being cooped up at home. So that's been kind of a crazy adventure, but it's been good. Um, I had a special little trip to see a company in Detroit. Uh, so I'll have a special episode on that next week on my channel. But this week, our video is not out yet, but it's going to be on mechanical energy storage options, something that you have covered a couple times, I think, in the past. I, I so. love that topic. It's a it's fun topic. Really fun. Yeah. What about you? How are you doing, Matt? I'm doing pretty good. Uh, I just put a video out this week exploring the difference between uh, solar panels and solar tiles and kind of going through all the different tile options because there's a lot more than just Tesla's solar tile roof. There's other options out there and kind of breaking down like the pros and cons of the two and the, the cost differences that you typically will see. Uh, it was a lot of information. It was a lot of numbers I was throwing at people. So hopefully it was useful to people. Yeah, it was a good follow up. I think it got into some of the details after your first video talking about the installation side and kind of the logistics of it. So very cool. Yeah. So yes, today is episode 26, I believe. Just yes, it is. chugging right along. Yeah. And I think it's time for us to start with our first story of the night, which is what we had on the, the, th the title and the thumbnail for the video, the autonomous vehicle world is shrinking and it's overdue. So it's not that the end of self-driving car companies or startups, it's more that they're consolidating. So if you rewind time to like 2016, if you just mentioned the words self-driving startup, investors would have like millions ready to throw at you, e even without like a business plan or anything else. And that's kind of where we were at that point. We, we live in a world now where there's so much interest and there's like a fear of missing out, even on the investment side. And so we had tons of companies that were starting up, but now we're seeing the opposite, which is we're seeing acquisitions and mergers and we're seeing kind of some consolidation, which is probably a healthy thing for the industry. Like for example, Lyft sold off their self-driving uh, self car division to Toyota. Toyota's making some moves, maybe not exactly in building EVs, but some other stuff. We reported, I think, four or five weeks ago that Cruise bought Voyage. Uh, Aurora merged with Uber's autonomous driving unit. And um, there have been a couple of others as well. And this is kind of keeping in, this is kind of in keeping with what's happening recently with other aspects of our world. Like, for example, if you remind time like six months ago, SPACs, you know, special merger, uh, special purpose acquisition companies were a huge deal. Uh, guys like Chamath were, were, were pumping up these different SPACs and eventually the bubble on that burst. And that happened with CCIV, which became Lucid Motors or is going to become Lucid Motors. That got hyped to such a crazy level. And when that came crashing down, the like everyone kind of woke up, came out of their days and realized this is a wildly, you know, speculative market. Maybe you should wait until they're more further along <laughs> before you consider investing. It's really just gambling before that. So there was a reckoning there. And I think it's the same thing here with self-driving tech. The reality is now five years later, we're not there yet. And it is a challenge, something Matt has said for a long time, which is like, we're still years away from this. So mm -hmm. I think the sobering reality is setting in. And some of these investors are thinking, I don't think I want to wait around for this. Like, why don't we sell? Why don't we buy? Why don't we, you know, acquire and and move on? So that is, <laughs> that's kind of where we're at with this. Uh, by the way, Jonathan Brown is in the comment section. I just saw his his email. He had emailed me. He was having trouble with Tesla getting his solar turned on. And I sent him an email, got him in touch with some people, and he's up and running. So congratulations, nice. Jonathan, for for that. Really cool. So, Matt, what do you, what do you take about this and the... Uh, the consolidation of this was inevitable companies. like you could see this coming because there were hundreds of these companies around it was like oh there's going to be kind of a, a coming apocalypse for these companies there's gonna be consol consolidation and now it's happening and we're at the stage right now where it's going to take deep pockets to keep investing on this because it's we're still years away from this being a real thing 
And so that's going to take a lot of money. And like you said, there's investors that are like, I'm out. It's like, we're not in this for the long haul. So it makes sense when you have companies like Lyft selling off to Toyota, uh, Cruise buying, was it Voyage? Uh, Aurora being uh, merged with Uber. It's like, it's Apple buying drive.ai. It's like, it's all these massive companies that have deep pockets scooping up the little guys that just can't, they can't stay in the race because it's, it's an endurance race at this point. It's going to be the next five to 10 years perfecting this stuff and they just don't have the money to do it. So it was inevitable and there's going to be more to come too. And in the article, I thought it was pretty funny because there's a lot of quotes from a, a woman named Missy Cummings, uh, who's the director of hum, uh, was it Humans and Autonomy Lab at Duke University. And she's been long saying, this is much longer than people realize. And the CEOs that are going around and saying, oh, we're doing all this crazy stuff have been overselling it for a long time. But if you talk to the engineers actually doing it, they're all saying, no, we're still years away, but it's just been oversold in the marketplace. And so I just love the fact that she's kind of sitting there going, told you so, here we go. Here, here comes the consolidation. So it's, it's, I, I still have, you know, it's going to happen. It's just, it's inevitable that it's going to happen. It's just a matter of when and, and having patience. We're not going to have it this year. I know Tesla, I mean, Elon keeps saying Tesla's going to have full self-driving. It's going to be complete and it's complete in feature, but it's not going to be complete that you can actually use it in the way that we all want to use it. Um, we'll get benefits of the features, but it's not going to be true, you know, true felt soulful self driving where you can have your car drive across the city to come pick you up. It's like, that's not going to be happening for anytime soon. Yeah. So yeah, the, the excitement from investors with software companies is, is obvious and it's apparent because you can yeah. scale up to a million users and make a billion dollars pretty quickly. Like the number of employees at Facebook compared to how many billions in revenue they make, it's shocking. Like you can you can make a billion dollars in revenue with like a hundred in engineers and like five hundred employees, compared to like three hundred thousand people at Walmart or or McDonald's. But what people don't realize is that yeah, self driving, it's just software engineers. It's it's software that stuff scales up and it's not that expensive. But these software engineers are paid huge amounts of money, yeah. like easily a third of a million, like three hundred thousand, four hundred thousand dollars each and you have a team of those guys and the management and all of that plus with self-driving you, you're collecting like terabytes of data like computer vision data so now we're talking like data centers and managing that then you have then you have things like you know the, the machines that train the machines and you have even human testers as well people don't realize a lot of these machines are not fully self-training so you need some manual oversight. So you have people checking and labeling things and saying, yeah, that, was a, that wasn't that, that was this. So the cost to do this is pretty high and it gets higher and higher as you're collecting more data. You, know, you went from 100 cars in your fleet to 10,000 cars and 100,000 cars. Like that data ratchets up pretty quickly. So though it is software and when somebody does figure it out, it's gonna be incredibly huge. It's a huge road ahead. And I think people are starting to sober up to that reality. Tesla's, you know, still on the forefront of that. And I think they're going to have a subscription plan and they're going to have their beta out to more people. But everybody has to probably just take a deep breath and, and know it's going to take a while. Yeah, definitely. Well, next up, next story is a report that just recently came out that's predicting that electric cars will be cheaper in Europe than conventional cars by 2027, which is sooner than I was thinking it was going to happen. But it's it's pretty exciting what they're predicting. And part of the reason I think that they're predicting Europe is because they're further ahead than we are in North America for uh, regulations around uh, gasoline cars to try to push people to EVs. So the EV adoption is happening there faster. Uh, but what this required in the report, they stated that it's still going to require tighter laws for CO2 targets in the uh, European Union. Uh, some strong EV infrastructure support is still needed. And they are saying that it's going to be sedans and SUVs first, that they'll probably reach price parity in 2026, and smaller vehicles will come later, probably in 2027. Uh, and most of this is coming from the massive falling prices of battery production that they're predicting are going to be around, it's going to be about a 58% decrease in cost by, I think it's 2030 that they're predicting. And that's the big reason why this is going to happen. And there's some interesting like charts they included in the report showing the, the crossover for the different sizes of segments, as well as um, if you look at this, this one I thought was interesting. It's with the right policies, 
the kind of S curve of adoption that they're predicting. And this is my favorite thing about S curves. It's like, it always feels slow at first. And then we're going to hit this period where it's just going to be like, suddenly smartphones were just everywhere because everybody was buying smartphones back when the iPhone became a thing and then Android phones became a thing. It's like, you can kind of see where we are now in this graph. Look just 2024 to 2027 and, and it's just going to take off, which you can expect. But then of course, by, you know, 2035, every car that's being sold will be an EV. So what, what's your take on this? Yeah, that, could you go up a little bit to that previous chart? Um, that chart seems very optimistic to me and they didn't really provide too much context into how they came up with this, but they're actually showing that like petrol cars, gas cars are going to go up in price a little bit, meaning they'll be harder to manufacture, which I, I think that might be the case, especially as vendors and other subcontractors stop making parts for them. Some of those costs will go up. But that line seems very convenient for the EV cost reduction. My one concern or caveat I, I throw out there is the battery supply chain is very tricky. And yeah. the, the amount of lithium and some of these rare earth materials that you need to form these packs is such a massive volume. And again, they're rare earth materials. They're, they're not just abundantly found like aluminum, for example. So for that reason, you're going to have serious competition between all these car, car companies who are making millions of cars. And so now if I'm going to take my million gas cars and instead make a million EVs, that tax is going to be tricky. So I think that line is not going to be quite so predictable and it's not going to be quite so, uh, not linear, but like kind of like, you know, looks like, like a quadratic. So that's my only concern. There, there might be more to the story and you know, COVID and what we've seen with like the chip shortages and stuff, which is not even really related, has us already thinking about scarcity and, and all these different supply chain bottlenecks that we're starting to see. So my hope is we don't see that. And I, I'm hoping we find new sources of these materials or new battery types where we mm -hmm. need less of things like nickel and, and no cobalt. So we are heading in the right direction. And we're, we're an ingenious species. I think we will figure it out. So maybe, maybe I'm Maybe I'm over overstating it, but very exciting. And what's what? what why do you think they said Europe? I, I was going to ask you that. The, they made it clear that this is in Europe. So is there something different that ha is happening in North America that maybe it's going to be they, different? Yeah, they talked a lot about policies. That a lot of what's going to drive this adoption is going to be policies. And here in the U.S., we don't have any. We don't have strong EV policies right now. Where in Europe, they do. Different aspects of Europe have some pretty strong policies already. And they were saying that to really kind of make sure that this prediction comes true, there needs to be stronger um, transitions from gasoline to EV and policies put in place, building out EV infrastructure more than they already are. So that was kind of the thing they kept driving home in the article, which was just policies. Government policies are going to really help accelerate this, in addition to the dropping battery costs. And I do think what the point you brought up is really good. It's a it's kind of a rallying cry for vertical integration, which is what Tesla's been doing. Like they're <laughs> they're trying to own as much of that stack as they can, even going down to trying to source their own supplies, their own nickel, you know, that kind of stuff, their own lithium. It's like, I think we're going to see that happening more and more. I wouldn't be surprised if we see GM and VW and those kind of companies start to do similar things to make sure that their supply chain is owned as much by them to be the master of their own destiny. Otherwise, there's going to be shortages around and you're going to have companies like Toyota, which we'll be talking about a little bit later, but companies like that that are kind of behind the eight ball that may not have the supply chain in place to support what they need to do to be able to achieve something like this. Yeah, you know, I was reading a little bit about the the the, the gasoline shortages and stuff. Oh, yeah, I mean, if it's if awful. that continues, if those kinds of trends happen, and this, yeah, it could be a little bit tricky. But I'm glad I have an electric vehicle right now. I'll say that much with, yeah. with what's going on. Um, yeah. Yeah, I, I agree. Hopefully, this this is a, a good look at what the future holds, and it's a similar story for North America as well. Yeah, are we ready for the, next, for the next story? Yep. Okay, so the next story is about something we've talked about in the past, offshore wind, which is going to be a big part of the future of energy production, and how in the U.S. we're starting to greenlight our very first large-scale commercial uh, offshore wind project. So, this project here is going to be um, 
installing up to 84 turbines off the coast of Massachusetts. So Matt is is on the right coast yeah. of, of history here <laughs> with this one. <laughs> It'll produce about 800 megawatts of electricity, which is enough for 400,000 homes. And to put that into perspective, we currently have two small East Coast generating uh, uh, stations that combined for about 42 megawatts of electricity. So we're talking like a, a factor of 20 times the production that we currently have. Yep. Now, this is a drop in the bucket compared to the 30,000 megawatts that, they're, that they have off the coast of, of Europe. So it's still uh, kind of, or t- sorry, 25,000 megawatts. So it's still a drop in the bucket compared to that, but it is a step in the right direction. And we've talked about, we talked about it before, but like offshore wind is really pretty predictable. The the delta temperatures between land and, and the oceans and just convection currents r- result in pretty predictable output. So this is a major step in a future where we have more renewable energy. And the U.S. has kind of been behind in this regard, so I'm, I'm happy to see that they're that they're uh, proceeding uh, this way. What, what do yeah. you think about this? Well, th- this be a... What's funny is, like, I live in the area, so I've been hearing about this project since 2009. It's like this has been a long time coming. And it's part of the reason I, I added the story to the, the our story ideas because it was like, hallelujah, it's finally happening. They're not going to just keep talking about it for the next decade. They're actually going to finally build this thing. Um, it's It's been a not in my backyard, NIMBY kind of movement here that's been kind of causing it to happen in fits and starts over the past decade. And it was just that last push that we needed federal approval to build it. So it's like, for me, I'm super excited this is happening. And hopefully this opens the floodgates for more of it to happen in different coastlines uh, around the country, because this could provide an insane amount of power for the United States. Um, A couple of things I thought would be interesting to bring up were, um, as I was reading up on more articles around this, uh, there's kind of a chicken and the egg problem with building massive facilities like this, because it requires specialized ships to build them, to like get the parts out there and build them up. And we don't have those ships. But the shipyards weren't willing to build the boats because nobody was building offshore wind turbines like this. So it's like this chicken and the egg thing. It's like, well, we need the ships to build the things, but we won't build the ships until you build the things. And so it was this kind of like, who's going to go first? So this project could be that kind of like door busting open to help shipyards build more of these boats, which will increase the infrastructure we need to be able to even build them in the first place. So there's there's a whole bunch of like ripple effects that this could potentially have up and down the coastline, which is for me, pretty exciting. Absolutely. And, you know, we don't really get in, into politics very much. So love him or hate him. Joe Biden has his first hundred days in office yeah, have been some of the most like impactful in terms of policy, I think, maybe in history. So he's he's got things in motion, which is which is really exciting, I think. Yeah, absolutely. Ready for the next story? Yeah, let's okay. do it. Okay. So next up, Elon oh, Musk. No. Yeah. <laughs> Elon Musk giving us a little bit of whiplash. Um, he's <laughs> suspending Bitcoin payments until it's more sustainable. And to me, when I saw this news come out, it was just like, wow, we're just getting kind of whiplash over what they're doing with Bitcoin and then Dogecoin. And he goes on Saturday Night Live and makes that comment about Dogecoin and Dogecoin like tanks, you know, the day after that. And now this has happened. And it's once again, it's kind of impacting the markets. Um the one thing about this that I thought was interesting was when they put the $1.5 billion into Bitcoin, a lot of people came out saying there's an environmental impact to cryptocurrencies, specifically Bitcoin uses an insane amount of electricity. And why would a company that touts itself as being all about green energy go into this currency uh, platform that is really not green? And so this is kind of Elon Musk kind of backtracking a little bit. And it's not a great look because uh, it makes it look like they didn't do their due diligence before they jumped in. <laughs> but at the same time, there was a more recent report that came out that uh, he's quoted a, a lot about the uh, energy generation that's required. And I thought this was an interesting chart. Um, it kind of shows since 2016, the energy use of Bitcoin. And so you can kind of see that the orange line right here through the middle is kind of the, the average predicted uh, energy use. And you can see just over the past year, it has increased dramatically. And the thin gray line that you see gets kind of spiking up here. That's the upper bound of consumption. Just it's insane how much just over the past year it has just spiked. And that's part of the reason why Elon is kind of backtracking because Bitcoin's energy use is just kind of 
out of control right now, and it's maybe not the best currency for this. There are other currencies that use less energy for their transactions. And that's where the energy use really comes in is the transactions, which is why they've shut down the accepting it for purchase. Because as long as they're just kind of sitting on it, it doesn't really have an impact. But as if they start doing transactions, it's going to have an impact. What is your take on this? Yeah, I'm really glad you broke that down between like deep storage versus transactionary. Um, the future for Bitcoin was, to my mind, never about a, a, a great transactionary coin. It was really about deep storage and deep value. So when they announced that they were going to take Bitcoin payment, um, that seemed kind of cool because as the price of Bitcoin has gone up, you could say, oh, I can sell one Bitcoin and buy a Tesla. So that was an interesting kind of um, correlation. But the problem with doing this is like you're... Elon is kind of this person, and I think he's this is starting to get, starting to get to his head. He's a person who could like <laughs> launch a thousand ships with, with with his tweets. You know, he's he's starting to have such power over some of these markets, and it's kind of kind of scary because I'm 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 a firm believer in Bitcoin as a, a storage medium for for wealth, because and not too much about transactionary. I, I think it just takes too long, like ten minutes. Those kinds of problems are going to persist, but as the the hashes get harder to solve as there's more people out there mining the, the you know the the competition to to solve the problems increases you're going to have larger runaway uh power consumption and to be honest this is probably something that satoshi or the, the original white paper and the people who were early bitcoin enthusiasts never considered but here we are now living in a world where it's terawatt hours of electricity used to keep this afloat. But I will say this. Oh, that's 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 such a cool graph. Um, I will say this, though. How much electricity is required to keep the American dollar afloat? So every payment and every visa and every database and every data center and every bank location and every, all the lights and the... Uh, it's not a trivial amount. Uh, to be honest, I think one of us should make this video. I've threatened yeah. to do it in the past. <laughs> but it's a, you know, like to keep the U.S. dollar operable is not free either but no. it's almost impossible to calculate whereas the beauty of bitcoin well the beauty or the not beauty depending on how you look at it is how easy it is to make these kinds of correlations because you can quickly back solve you know like the hashing power of various like asic uh, miners or gpus and figure out like the, the the difficulty levels and the number of you can kind of back solve how how much power is being used so I'm not sure if the U.S. dollar takes more. That, that, that is a wild amount of electricity for Bitcoin, but I still believe in the fundamentals of Bitcoin. I think we were... My main worry right now, and this is not exactly related, but my main worry in the next six months or a year is we, we're printing so much money and everybody has this kind of like desire to go put that somewhere that's not going to lose value. Yeah. So people are buying stock that maybe they wouldn't typically driving their own little micro bubbles. People are getting into crypto, Dogecoin, which is kind of funny. Um, but I think it shows that there's a general kind of concern with just how we're behaving in this. And I'm not sure there's a better way. I, I think we'd have to print our way out of the situation that we've been in with the pandemic. But uh, I'm just a little nervous, a little worried. And so Bitcoin to me is still a bet I'm making personally. And I just wish Elon would just leave it alone. Stop talking about it for a while. <laughs> like, don't take it. Don't don't not take it. Just leave it alone, <laughs> and it'll it'll kind of level. But as as people as he keeps bringing this up, it's um, yeah. This is a pretty rough week, and um, yeah, he he's a, he's in part to blame with with his uh, shenanigans, I guess. Yeah, he he does have he does wield a lot of power now, and. To me, the funniest moment was just the Saturday Night Live sketch, sketch with that he made the joke about Dogecoin. And then like it tanked. It was just like this. It's like, oh my gosh. It's like, it's a Saturday Night Live sketch. What is going on? He just, he, he carries so much sway that I don't know if he recognizes yet the power that he's wielding and he needs to pump the brakes just a little bit and, and use it a little more wisely. Um, oh, Yeah. I think he knows now. He also is fully aware of the power he wields, and I think it's starting to... He's getting a little drunk with power. <laughs> <laughs> and he yeah. does. He I'm, he might be the world's most influential man. I, I don't th I'm not even going to say it. I'm not going to qualify it. Elon Musk is the world's most influential person, and 
I don't even think it's close anymore. There's no celebrity. There's no athlete. There's no singer. There's no religious figure, not the Dalai Lama or the Pope. Nobody wields the kind of power he does. And uh, good or bad, it's, um, it is what it is. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Next up. This is, this is Matt's favorite story because uh, <laughs> this one is about the police investigating a Tesla driver spotted in the backseat <laughs> and getting arrested for doing this. Oh, and boy. a day or two... <laughs> A day or two after being released, he is spotted in a, in a red Tesla that he bought doing the same exact thing. And he says, you know, like, I'm happy to be arrested. He's this very rich San Franciscan whose parents live in some high rise. And he, he thinks that this is a tech that he needs to be showcasing, which is all fine and dandy. He trusts it. Um, but it just comes down to it's not legal. You're not allowed with a autonomous driving technology currently to not be at the wheel to intervene in the event that something goes wrong. And he is really pushing his luck. This is a, um, his name's Param Sharma, and he goes by Lavish P. I think that's all you need to know about this gentleman. I think that that, that does it for me. That gives me all the, all the insight that I need. And he doesn't appear to be stopping anytime soon. So this actually kind of makes me think, what could Tesla do in terms of revoking autopilot? I'm so for glad him? you. I'm Lifetime so ban. Yeah. What do you think? What, what do you do with something like this? Because it is wildly dangerous. I mean, imagine how would you feel if he comes crashing into your like causes loss of life or something? I mean, he's he's gonna be looking at like first degree <laughs> murder or something. I don't know. Take his license away. Beach uh, Beach Crow says, "Yeah, this is this is not okay. You can't you can't be." flagrantly uh, flaunting the law and the rules and and keep thinking you'll get away with it because you have a lot of money and you can hire lawyers at some point. I think um, he needs his comeuppance. Yeah, I, I like that you brought that up because I wrote two notes about this story. The first one was just don't. <laughs> just, just don't do this. Please, for the love of God, everybody stop doing this. People who do this. Uh, but the second note I wrote was, I wonder if Tesla could put a stop to this. And they really should because it's not a good look for them. I know they've done things where they will turn off uh, supercharging access for people who have like messed with their cars. It's like they should shut off people's full self-driving access if they're caught doing stuff like this that are so egregious and they're just and they're not using it the way it's designed to be used. And it's also illegal. It's like no matter how you slice this, what he's doing is dangerous and it's wrong. And Tesla probably should step in and turn off that feature and also like blacklist his account. So if he buys a new car, he can't add it to a new car. <laughs> it's like they probably should do something to distance themselves from him as much as possible because this is this is not going to be good for the company either. So it's there, there's something that they should be doing about this. They have the control. They, they could do something. Right. When I made that video about like the reality about FSD and how there's a lot more regulatory involvement than people realize. This is kind of what I mean. Um, <laughs> yep. who, I mean, don't you think that governments are going to come out and say, if you have any kind of a system, it has to have A, B, and C. And so like, it is very possible. Like, for example, I think the most, uh, the most hardcore is General Motors with their Super Cruise. There's a camera, um, right above the steering wheel looking at you and the minute your eyes come off the road like i was driving the bolt in la they, they had invited me up and it took me a while to figure out what like i was so mad i was like this super cruise thing is a piece of junk it keeps disengaging it's because i'm looking around the cabin trying to film something or show something or say something and the minute your eyes are off that road the car is like take over now and it just starts you know Tesla's is very uh, passive. You have your hand on the wheel. So I don't know how this kid was getting away with the requirement that your hand has to be on the wheel. Um, There's ways you know? to trick it. Okay, okay, I figured. <laughs> I, I won't so, describe how to do it, but there, there are ways sure. that you there are ways that you can trick it. So it's like he's got to be doing those tricks. So this kind of gets to the thing. This we need rules in place, and we're not even close to that. We, I think we need to be like engineering complete first to then understand what, what approaches we need. And Tesla has a camera like up on top that they're gonna Im implement, implement, but the angle of that doesn't appear to be that great. Like the way it's looking at you, I'm sure it's a very wide angle. 
it's not as good as where GM has their camera. Mm -hmm. So what's to say that the lawmakers come out and say, you must have a camera at eye level monitoring the driver X, Y, Z. And, and then your model three, unless you have a retrofit wouldn't qualify for full self-driving. And that was always my point is there's no way you can say that this car has everything you need for full self-driving, uh, or level five autonomy, I should say, mm -hmm. because that rule hasn't even been defined yet. So these kinds of idiots, let, let's say, <laughs> yes. who are really pushing the boundaries in a bad way are yeah. how we're going to figure out what we do and don't need. Um, it's, hopefully it's, he doesn't hurt anybody and he stops his stuff, but... It's people like him that mean we can't have nice things. It's I essentially, agree. that's what it is. <laughs> that's exactly, that's exactly right. Um, and this <laughs> one does irritate me because he's kind of pushing um, uh, fake driver cameras with photos. Yeah. We just don't know what it will be. But Tesla has a lot in their plate. Uh, they have the driver seatbelt, um, the driver seatbelt engaged. That yep. is some sort of a, a, a system they can monitor. They they might have weight sensors in the seat. That should be another one. You should have to have some, you have to have your butt on the seat. You can trick that too, right? Get a bucket of bricks or something. There are things you can do. But that camera with machine learning that's looking at your eyeballs and figuring out what you're doing, yep. that's going to be pretty much impossible to trick i think exactly um, and as and as soon as they do they'll have to make it like the iphone where it, it it's doing like a depth field and making sure it's not like a like a picture or something you know yeah but this is interesting tesla could probably figure this out and they and they need to they need to be able to remotely remove autopilot access it has to be something that they do like in the next software update because of stuff like this the minute these kind of stories tesla stock is has been on a very bad streak as well. They had that crash and this, these kinds of jokers doing this kind of stuff. So hopefully they have something in place and um, this is not an issue going forward. Thank you for the super chat, Bill. I really appreciate it. So do you want to jump to the last, go to the last story? Yeah. Okay. So for the last story, uh, Subaru teases a new Solterra all electric SUV coming to the US next year which is pretty cool uh when you put this story onto the uh onto the list it, the first thing that came to mind that jumped into my head was this is basically just subaru's version of the toyota what was it the bz 4x that we talked about just a few weeks beyond ago. zero yeah exactly yeah, it's, it's basically <laughs> just the subaru branded version of that ev because it's they're the same company essentially um but the thing that i thought was pretty cool is it's going to be available next year um but to me, this is, I'm still in the same camp as I was when we talked about that car. It's like, it's a, it's a good looking car. I'm, I'm the teaser images look great. I'm looking forward to it. Cause I really do like Subaru as a brand. I'd have a lot of friends that swear by Subaru. They will only buy Subaru. So it's like to have this in the market, it's gonna be really cool. But I just wonder if it's, if super, if Subaru as a brand is going to be going into the same kind of hopeless place that Toyota seems to be going with their EV strategy too, because it's basically the same, same car. Uh, what was your, what was your take on this story? I think you're totally right about the fact that this is going to be the platform that they share with the Toyota version. Uh, look at the pictures. I think your intuition is, is spot on. It, they look identical. I mean, the sheet metal might be a little bit different, but underneath the, um, the underpinnings are all the same. Um, we talked about this a lot. The, the Japanese companies are very conservative, and this would be the second or third such uh, collaboration. The the Toyota FRS and the BRZ, which is a little sports car, has the same kind of uh, shared joint platform approach. And in that case, it wasn't that it was an EV. Toyota really does not believe in coupes anymore, but they want to have some in their stable because they, they used to make fun cars, the MR2 and the Celica and the Supra. So I think what they're realizing is we're not going to spend a billion dollars on the development of a coupe that no one's going to buy because coupe sales are down in a big way as people buy bigger cars. So why not share the cost and build a car that we could build two of? And So for that reason, I'm not like... I'm not penalizing them too much. I think it does make some business sense. I don't think they're in a position to build a ton of EVs. We talked about this before. Japan has this hydrogen kick. Uh, just mm -hmm. the entire country does. There's there's a lot of investment there, even in, in like residential and commercial, industrial, uh, not just automotive. So they are clearly not 
at the forefront of this, but I, I'm hoping that the sales for this car will be good. There are people who love their Toyotas, and I'm a firm believer that um, the Germans and the Volkswagens, there's probably some people who love the German cars. Uh, the German Germans make great cars, the Japanese make better cars. I think Toyota and Honda, those kinds of companies, are, when it came to gasoline cars, at the top of the line in terms of like the highest quality product. So there are probably buyers waiting for something with a Toyota badge on it before they'll buy an electric vehicle. Yeah. Just like there was for like Ford. When there's a Ford, I'll buy it. Mach-E sales have been good. When there's a Volkswagen, ID4 is going to do well, I think. So Toyota, I think, stands above either of those companies as far as like a, like a standard bearer. So I'm hoping that the sales of this car, even try as they might, as much as they're trying to stink this up, <laughs> I'm hoping the sales will give them the feedback loop that they need to say, okay, why don't we get serious about this and, and do a better job? Yeah, if they sell them as fast as they can make them, I think that's going to send a pretty clear message to them that they need to kind of wake up and rethink their strategy. Because I'm I'm losing hope. I'm losing hope in Toyota and Honda. I'm it's it's really sad because they are like you said they're like some of the best car makers in the world. It's like I I want to see them succeed. And like I said, I have friends that are swear by Subaru. It's like I want to have more options for people that are brand loyal like that. So I hope it succeeds. I hope it's a good car. A little, a, little dis- a little disappointed. That's it. Yeah. The only hope now is if they, if they get their act together from having record success, even though they've tried not to have it. <laughs> <laughs> Try as they might. Yeah. Well, that was the last story for the evening. So we're going to jump to the Q&A portion of the show. Just talk about whatever you guys want to talk about. So we'll start scanning through the messages, chime in. And be sure to hit that like button if you're enjoying the show. There, there was a there was a comment earlier when we were talking about the offshore wind. Uh, I think it was James uh, who said, "Matt, are you going to be getting some offshore wind to power your your future lair?" And uh, there's some <laughs> there's some news. It sounds like Matt is the lair is progressing, and the offshore progressing. wind <laughs> might just be the uh, the ticket. Yeah, I don't know if I'll be getting a uh, wind energy for it, but the, the lair is progressing. Oh, well, thank you, John, for the super chat. Um, the gas shortage, let me put it up on the screen. The gas shortage on the East Coast, do you think the sale of the Ford Mach-E and Tesla's increased? Just from this, I would say no. Um, but the gas prices in general have been rising. Uh, like It's like what, over $3 a gallon now. It's like I think that could have an impact on sales. What's your take? Yeah, I, I haven't... Um... I haven't thought too much about it. I think what people need is a long-term problem. Yes. We have such short-term memories. If there's a gas problem for a week, nobody will even remember it happened like two weeks from now. But if we have like the 1970s (laughs) situation where people are in lines and getting turned back and they can't fuel their cars, that will stick with people. That was when Honda and Toyota got their start. It was That was exactly the period when people said, Maybe I don't need this fuel gas guzzling Oldsmobile that weighs 8,000 pounds and gets eight miles a gallon. Maybe I'll buy the Civic that gets 30, right? So that's kind of how they got their start. And to John's point, if these sorts of issues with like more levels of um, instability with, with gasoline happens for a month or two or three, yeah, I think people will think of electric as a far more stable option, which we talked about in the past. Electricity is far more of a stable commodity than gasoline, which requires huge levels of, I mean, worldwide collaboration to make this thing happen. Thank you, James Owens, for your super chat. So we should talk about this because Matt didn't know, um, Matt didn't didn't know about this before the show. (laughs) No. Our our friends... Yeah, we're, we're, we're good friends with those guys over at our Ludicrous Future. Ben Sullins lives like 10 miles from me. Um, I've, I've chatted with Everyday Astronaut before. We both love Answers with Joe. Joe, uh, Joe Scott is one of our favorite channels. So when we heard the news today that they were going offline, that was kind of a shocker because that, yeah. that was a solid podcast. Um, they put on a good show, and it's like a two-hour show they put on. So... This sentiment, uh, very honored. I, you agree? I feel pretty honored to, yes, to hear that. Yes, I'm very honored. Yes. And, and and they gave us a shout out. So huge shout out to our ludicrous feature. Thank you, Joe and and team for for giving us that shout out. Appreciate We're very it. honored. 
And for anybody who's come here from that, please do us a favor. Reach out and let us know what kind of stuff did they cover that you loved. We, we're we happy to cover whatever is, is of, of interest. We, we've been talking largely about electric vehicles, but we don't have to. We can talk about whatever you guys want. So yeah. as always, like, reach out to us and let us know what you want to see. Yeah, we love all the same topics they loved. So we're, we're everything's fair game. Just let us know. Yeah, so we, we appreciate you guys for that. And uh, Jambay says, four dollars a gallon on the East Coast. Um, yeah, <laughs> welcome to California prices. As, as more of the country pays what we've been paying for years, um, they might have a different opinion about their gas-guzzling SUV. I want to see you adjust your camera so you're upside down. Jambe says, "I don't know the reference." To that. <laughs> Neither do you? I. I was just reading that, going, "I don't get, I don't understand the reference." But I've seen the kind show. Of... I don't think those chaps are upside down. Um, give me something there. <laughs> I have to put this up. James Paul said, "Great to hear that your layer is progressing, Matt." Will you also be harvesting energy from the lava beneath your hollowed-out volcano? Am I a Bond villain now? What's going on? <laughs> 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 you might have to trade in your dog for a cat or something. Yeah, soon, exactly. Yeah. A little white cat that'll sit here pet the entire show. Um, more, more of a serious note. John Clayton says, "I live in Atlanta. Uh, there, there is still. I think he meant no gas stations near me that have gas. My fuel light is on, and I'm stuck at home with no options. I'm uh, wanting to buy a Tesla, and this has definitely reinforced that." Um, Gasoline has been so important to every country that we've made it work. But it, like we talked about, it is a house of cards. A lot of things have to happen for gasoline to just be at your at your station. In comparison, electricity is kind of simple. And that's what I love about it. Even if the power went out, I could I wouldn't be able to charge I wouldn't be able to charge my car and drive a whole lot. But I could drive 30 miles a day, run my house with my solar and my power wall, and and I could survive. Which um, which, John, I think you have the right attitude or the right idea. I hope you guys are back on track with gasoline soon and, you know, your, maybe your plans will, will progress more quickly. But, yeah, I'm with you. I, I think this is exactly the kind of moment where you realize uh, having a, a backup option is a good thing. Because yeah. I have a gas car, too. I think you do, too, right? Yeah, we do. Yep. Yeah, I know somebody down in Georgia that waited in a line to get gas 15 dollars of gas for two and a half hours because they the, they kidding. were limiting how much gas they could get it was like 15 dollars of gas per person and they waited two and a half hours to get it like, that is just um, not good i i feel bad I'm, I'm, i haven't really been keeping up with this news enough do you do we know what is causing this panic buying it was all panic buying it really? was there was plenty of gas in the country to support whatever was going to happen it just is a matter of transporting it to the region. And so the, the areas down there, the governors down there were basically saying, please don't buy gas, just buy what you need and that's it. And there were people that were buying and hoarding like the toilet paper crisis. <laughs> there were people filling up like gasoline containers stacked into the back of their cars. They were just taking hundreds of gallons of gas when they didn't need to. It was, it was the panic buying that, that caused the problem. But what triggered the panic buying? It was the uh, the gas pipeline getting shut down from the hack that happened okay. that shut it down. But that that was which yeah. is a temporary thing. Typically, it's, like, it's an overreaction. Um, yep, as yep. always. Yeah, that bong calls the hack on the East Coast score. That that um, that touches on something that we didn't have on the board, or you know, we didn't really have any interest in talking about. But the U.S. I used to work. I don't know if I've told you guys this before, but I I spent six years in the Department of Defense, and I had a top secret clearance, and so. In that time, I've I had a very interesting perspective about like how the government works, especially like the top secret stuff where money's no object, and you know like you could get whatever you need to get done, they'll make it happen. We are in we invest in a lot of the wrong things. We're happy to spend money. One thing that every president, Republican, Democrat, whoever has in common is defense spending. That is a point of like American patriotism or pride or whatever you want to call it. But what's lacking is 
some people with vision and clarity about like the future and technology and the internet and where the real threats are to be able to kind of corral the spending into the right places. We're building tanks when people like the, our troops have said like, please, we, we don't need tanks. No one's using them. And we're just using them as like a jobs program to keep some gov you know, some senator in some state that, do that builds tanks uh, occupied and employed. But we need to be spending money on retrofitting some of these systems. You'd be shocked at the kinds of computer systems that run very critical systems in the US. Um, I can't talk about a couple of the, I think this one I can't talk about. A nuclear, our nuclear arsenal systems are like 1980s computers running like firmware and part, like if a part breaks, they don't make them anymore. We don't have drivers for them. It's a, it, we're in, it's a very kind of sad state of affairs. We need to, we need to modernize some of this stuff in a, in a major way. So as bad as this thing has been, I think it hopefully will start to, to showcase the need for smarter spending because we aren't doing a good job of that right now, really. No. Key infrastructure is too vulnerable right now and we need to upgrade it, get people in place that know what they're doing with this technology. <laughs> Aptera Reboot says the overreaction, it was an overreaction, but perfectly reasonable to have bought extra gas. I was seeing pictures on Twitter of people who were filling up plastic ba bags. bags. <laughs> that's not reasonable. That is that is an that is not that's a Darwin Award right there. It, it is because depending on the the construct of that plastic, it may or may not handle that for very long. Like, no, you know, the gasoline would eat right through it. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah, exactly. How are we doing on the like count? No, we're not talking about likes here, Matt. We... Yeah, come on, come on, guys. Somebody think of the likes. <laughs> think of the likes. We're not it's even like, at 100 yet. Yeah, there's, there's, right, 200 people, there's 200 people here. <laughs> Hit the like button. <laughs> exactly. What would happen if all of us just overreacted really quickly and just hit that like button? Exactly. I'm curious. Maybe. <laughs> Mike says that the Hubble telescope runs on like a 386 uh, Intel chipset. Um, not sure about that, but it's something very, very old and outdated. Part of it is it goes to show you how greatly optimized and how powerful and how well the code is written in those times to make things work. But the problem really is about maintainability. It becomes impossible to keep these old systems up to date. Um, somebody joked about Windows 95. There's a reason why Windows is begging you to upgrade and making Windows, uh, the new Windows, Windows 10, cheaper and cheaper and free and up because they do not want to continue to have to update those last eight guys on Windows 95 yep. who yep. refuse to upgrade because it's hugely expensive and the vulnerabilities don't go away just because it's old. So it's a real pain in the butt. One of the reasons why I'm an iOS developer and not an Android developer is because iOS people upgrade quickly and usually about 70% of all iOS users are on the latest version within a couple of weeks, whereas Android is a just a wild west. Yep. You have people running like eight years worth you know, worth of versions. And if you're a developer on Android, you got to account for that. It's, it's, it is not a uh, enviable task. Yeah, I used to work in software development on mobile devices, making mobile games. And it was always so easy to do the iOS stuff because it was like yeah. everybody was kind of the latest and greatest. And we had to, the QA department QAing the Android builds of the games were just like, I felt so bad for them. So it's many. A, it's a tough, old, tough outdated to devices. All right, the like button situation is improving, Matt. I, I, I will say. I think we're at about 120, so that's good. Uh, so Lester Marshall, I'm going to write this down because I love good book uh, recommendations. I'll have to write this down. He says, read The Fifth Risk by Michael Lewis. Um, have not heard of it, have you? No, I haven't. But um, I'm on a bit of a reading kick, and I will, I'll add that to the list. Thank you for that. So, uh, Sky m Skimming Foral Get, <laughs> I'm saying that wrong. Um, I think he's one of our new viewers. By the way, welcome. I'm sorry I butchered your name. I think he came from our ludicrous future because he mentioned that when he first came in. He says, which guy is Matt and which guy is Ricky? I am Ricky. <laughs> I am Matt. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> and don't worry if you mix that up. Go ahead. 
We could be brothers, and we get that all the time, so it's not a problem. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah bong hollywood says this is why linux if people know uh what they're doing is very hard to hack yeah linux gets updated very regularly um it's a good system it's sadly it's not a huge percentage of installations for home use but it's the most from... used operating system in the world because it's like on right. every embedded device that you can think of exactly it's the underpinnings for Mac OS. So anytime there's like some critical vulnerability fixes on Linux, Mac kind of gets it for free. The one interesting thing, I don't know if this is true that I've heard about, there's more com conversation about the space station using 3D6, Hubble uses 4D6. Some of it is actually deliberate choices to use really old hardware because it has to do with the size of the transistors because cosmic rays and things like that and radiation can actually impact the performance of chips. So if you put the latest and greatest, you know, six nanometer processor up into space, it may not behave as expected. Um, I don't know if that's 100% true. I would have to dig into that more, but that's what I had heard years ago. That's very interesting. Yeah, no, that it makes sense. The the spacing between transistors on like a five nanometer process, like what we have on our iPhones today or our MacBooks, is is like quantum scale. Yeah. So it'd be easy to imagine that a little bit of radiation could could cause some disturbance and and completely cause problems. That's very interesting. I hadn't thought of that. Um, Bong Hollywood says it's called ion bombardment. Good. Good to know. Um, that's very interesting. I feel like if we got these guys in the chat right now in a room together, we could make the best YouTube videos ever. <laughs> we have all the brain power we ever need. <laughs> I'm always blown away by the people who watch our videos, really. I don't know. I feel like they should be the ones up here and we should be in there like with a notebook. like taking. I feel like a dunce half the time. It's like... <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Uh, so Rodney Jackson says, solar roof question. My saga continues. I remember Rodney was on uh, a couple weeks ago. Have you heard anything about their no tear off beta for solar roofs? No, don't think so. Um, Rodney, if you send me an email, I can do the same thing I did for um, for the other gentleman that we spoke with earlier and see if we can get you connected with uh, with uh, Jonathan Brown was was the, was the gentleman and see if we can maybe connect you with somebody at Tesla who who can get things done, because sometimes it's just the person that, you know, or meeting the person that can that can get it done. So uh, Akil Jindal had had uh, commented earlier about what are we reading right now. Um, I told <laughs> I told Matt that I've been reading books about like influence or understanding human psychology because if we're going to be YouTubers and we're going to be on YouTube, you got to understand the game. You got to understand how people think. You got to appeal on a on a on a broad scale. So I've been reading kind of some books about that. Forget the. Uh, Caldini, uh, he's a pretty popular, he, you guys have probably seen his books on influence and stuff. And then I'll have to pick up some more. What about you? What are you reading right now? I'm actually not reading much of anything, but I was telling Ricky earlier, I'm going on a trip where I'm going to be driving for like six hours. So I'm trying to load up a whole bunch of audiobooks for the trip. So if anybody has suggestions, just drop them down below because it's like I'm looking for things to read or listen to. And Akil Jindal, Jindal says, do Clubhouse. That would be pretty fun. Imagine if we scheduled a day on Clubhouse and it wasn't just you and me and these guys in chat. We were all just talking. That talking. could be really fun. Yeah, it could be fun. That could be fun. Um, we should do that. <laughs> what if we What if we made the show like on YouTube for 30 minutes or something on occasion and then we jumped over to Clubhouse? We could figure it out. I think that'd be a lot of fun. Yeah. Because it'd be more engagement. It'd be, it, it, every, we'd all be on the, on the same playing field, which is what we've always wanted. There might be a way to do both. 
That's a good idea. Why not just do both? We're already talking, right? Yeah, it's like we might be able to do. I don't. There's got to be a way that you can do both. There's yeah. now you got us thinking. Yeah. Thank you, Akil. <laughs> we'll, we'll we'll look into it. So there's generally a lot of conversation around. Um, the tech, you know, how old some of these systems are. Somebody mentioned that um, Tim McDonald said, I did see that there were thousands of Ford pickup trucks waiting on semiconductors, which is a bizarre thing to think about. We're not talking about electric vehicles or this is just good old fashioned gasoline cars. The average yep. gas car has got like 50 ECUs and all of those are little computer circuits. So it doesn't take much of a shortage to have, have problems. What's really crazy is I heard Tesla's making some maneuvers to not be as affected by this chip shortage. So I don't know enough about it yet, but maybe that could be a fun thing to talk about too. Oh, thank you, Brian brought up. I should check out the book, Console Wars. And yes, you are correct. I am a child of the 80s and grew up with Nintendos and Sega in the 90s, worked at video game companies. So yes, I am into video games. <laughs> my, my wife has told me this before. Uh, skimming for... for... Cast. Why can't I say that? That's such a hard <laughs> name for me to say. He says I should uh, read... I should narrate audiobooks if, you know... I have some news I'll share in, in the coming weeks, but yeah, depending on how, how my channel goes, I might have to do something like that to, to supplement <laughs> my income. Secondary income. <laughs> exactly. There you go. Well, Rodney said, they offered me a $2,500 discount for some new beta program. Not sure if you were aware of anyone going through that, if it's good or bad. I haven't heard a thing about that. I haven't either. I haven't either. And I'm not sure exactly what the beta program would entail either. But but good luck, really. It, it's um, the saga. That's probably the best way to put it. Um, and hopefully it, it's coming to an end sooner than later. Are we close to 150 likes? That'd be cool. We, yeah, we're pretty close. James Paul, and I, I agree with this. You see, the, you see what he wrote? He says, Matt, you should invite your brother. Uh, or he's, invite your brothers. Maybe we both have brothers. You have one brother? I have one brother. I do too. He's, but his, yours is older, right? He's older, yeah. Mine's yeah. younger. That'd be, that'd be a blast. Yeah. I don't know how my brother would, would do, but I've heard your brother. You guys are really funny. Um, <laughs> if you guys are not aware, Matt has a, pod, uh, a podcast as well. A, that it's kind of accompanies his show called To still Be to, Determined. Yeah, Still To Be Determined. Still yeah. To Be Determined. Okay. Yeah. And it's really cool because him and his brother get to chat, and I always, I'm always like, man, I want to be on that show. There's some really good moments where they, he's really funny. He's very, he's a very funny guy. Um, he is a very funny guy, and I like his sense of humor. It's very kind of British, stiff lip, and he's he's very funny. So that would be fun. We should maybe have a little clubhouse and, and if you if you watch us, you'll 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 probably be in the group of people. We get comments in every single episode. You guys look like twins. It's like we don't look like twins. We look like brothers. We don't look like twins. But we look a lot could, alike. Yeah, I we, got that we wear too. very similar glasses. We're both bald, so it's like there's a lot of <laughs> there's a lot of similarities there. Yeah. Yeah. So James Paul says, uh, Jambe, I heard that Tesla pivoted to use different chip suppliers. So in in software, there's there's some different philosophies that really come into play here. So one of them is like being modular, having abstraction layers. So imagine if you're Tesla and you've got this supplier who does this chip. If you write your code really well, what you should do is abstract it from the exact nature of what it is that you're running on. That way, what you could do is if you had to go to some other chip supplier or some other architecture or some other platform, all you got to do is swap out the abstraction layer that kind of one-to-one -one maps what the hardware does to what your code is doing. And the rest of your code could just go right into it. So... Tesla being a tech company, when, when we say that Tesla's a tech company, they're a software company, these are the sorts of things that they probably do really well. And their code, I would imagine, is well-equipped 
to easily be scaled onto other platforms, much more so than other OEMs. James Paul has the most accurate quote, uh, accurate comment of the night. He says, both equally handsome, Matt. And, um, <laughs> Jeez. I, think, I think that's right. <laughs> yeah. I responded to him just laughing out loud. Yes. I like to think that each is more handsome than the last. <laughs> and Gary mentioned, I saw a video today about a Swedish company that's building a 3D printer that prints steel. I got to look into that. Wow. That's cool. I wonder what kind of energy usage it has. It's got to kind of take some energy to, to melt steel. To but That sounds really cool. <laughs> well, we're actually at time. All right, we need eight people to hit like. Yeah. Any eight of you guys, it's your it's your chance to be a hero. Come on, <laughs> let's get to one fifty. Come on, come on. Bong, I appreciate it. Bong Hollywood says uh, Matt and Ricky, it's the it, are, are the yin and yang of YouTube tech. I think we typically. I like to think that we think of it a little bit differently. We value privacy. We think of some of the other aspects of it. A lot of the YouTube tech videos that I see are all talking about the cool speed and this and that, but we got to think about the uh, the human cost or the you know the look yeah. on privacy and some of the other things that maybe fall through the cracks. So yeah, I, that's a, I appreciate that. Barrios Laura says keep it up she gave us a sticker and had a super chat thank you so much we really appreciate you i don't think i've ever seen uh her on before so really appreciate you welcome yeah. aboard if you're new and like we talked about before please let us know the topics you want to cover we should have a little uh mailing list where people could contribute ideas for stories and we can kind of vote on them and stuff there's no reason why we have to pick the topics right yeah exactly yeah it's a good idea I think we're going to have to call it. We hit 150. 150. Yes. We did it. Thank you, everybody, so much. For all the new viewers who, who've who tuned in from our ludicrous future, um, it's kind of sad that they're they're stopping, but, you know, it it's tough. It takes a lot of coordination, and um, we hope you'll enjoy being a part of this show. Please subscribe and join us, and... Please get involved and write to us and let us know what you want to see. We, we're here to, to make it happen. Yeah, and we're live every Thursday at 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Pacific. And if you go to viceversa.show, you can get the audio version of the podcast. And just like Ricky said, thank you so much for watching, and we'll see you in the next one.